I had a plan to solve the um, Melville calculator for you, but I realized this morning that I was going to, the, the calculator has a, an example and I was going to run the example and that's the same example that I have included in the homework. So I, basically I was going to do the homework for you. So I decided not to do that. So you can do it on your own. You should be able to do that. Be careful because that is a very comprehensive calculator. However, in lieu of that, what I'm going to do today is to show you where all that originated. And I'm going to do this thing in here. Okay, what does this say? Well, of course, many of you can't read this. It's a, it's a report that we put together in the year um, 2013. I was hired by the people in Ensenada, by the university and uh, associates that I had over in there in Mexico and Ensenada to do the study, which took all, almost a year to do. And this is the, uh, the report on the study. So I'm just going to, since it's in Spanish, I can't really discuss it with you in detail. But I'm just going to go over the um, the figures, the pictures, so you can get a, a feel for it. If you wanna, if you can read the language and you wanna look at it, just send me a, an email and I'll lead you to the link. There's a numbered link in my on my site to this. So uh, the objective of this study was to evaluate the sand component in the Guadalupe Valley. A very important subject because the Guadalupe Valley is a is a very important valley in, in Baja California. They produce wines and so forth. They also produce or mine sand extensively. And the issue was how much can we mine sand and be within sustainability, so to speak. So that's, that's a picture of the Guadalupe Valley in here. And uh, this is about a hundred page report, by the way. This is the headwaters of the Guadalupe Valley. Uh, that, this is the profile. We had a story on that, which I believe I have already told you. At one time, the government out there decided to put some money together to study the sands. And they had a meeting in, in Tijuana. And they invited me because I was kind of associated with them. And I went over there and, uh, and was participating in the meeting. And they wanted to know where the sand was. And they were going to put a lot of money to figure out where the sand was. And I said to them, uh, I know where the sand is already. And I showed this profile. And I said, the sand is where the profile is flat. They were really surprised. But that's the truth. The sand, the sand is over here and over here. And this is where they mine. So there is no issue. There's no sand in here, right in here in this profile, there's no sand because, it, because it's rock. It, all this stuff, sand is coming from the, from the headwaters. It's being deposited in here. It's being run over here through the, through the, through the canyons, so the semi canyons. And we already know where the sand is. So these are the canyons. Uh, there's a couple of canyons out there. This, look at this canyon, this is an interesting one, isn't it? There's a canyon over there. Uh, millions of years that nature has spent uh, trying to carve or make a, a hole or, or an opening in this canyon and so forth. Uh, we, were, we also did sediment routing over here, sediment routing with this formula, which is the Exner formula. We haven't really covered that extensively because it's just too, too much, too complicated. It will be a second class. This is the gentleman that for many years, 30 or 40 years measured uh, or was in charge of the uh, climatological station out there at a place called Agua Caliente. This is the place where they measured the, the gauge. Oh, and this is the bridge that I've asked you to calculate, Guadalupe Bridge over Guadalupe uh, Creek, taken uh, 2011. We started this uh, 2011. Actually, this is was this picture was started uh, was taken much earlier, about a year earlier. Then we have in here um, the the I believe I already shown you the the Ford Bridge, or rather the Ford. This is a Ford, very large Ford out there in the Guadalupe Valley. And uh, then we were discussing here the issue of the um, who was mining what, and I mean the sand and where. And then we have a couple of our students posing for the picture where we were saying we were uh, taking samples of the sand so that we can come up with a grain size analysis. We did that in the in the San Diego State University at the geotech lab. The gentleman on the right is um, Alex Gostomelski, who um, got a degree, a master's degree in the year 2014. And I do believe that um, Rosa Aguilar, that is on the left, she also graduated in 2014. So these two people were studying master's degree at the time with me, they were, they were my students. Rosa is now working for a company in Rancho Bernardo. Since she graduated, she went over there to work. So, so that's been eight years already. 
And Alex is now big boss out there in the city, the city of San Diego, in a, in a urban drainage or something like this. And uh, he remains my very close associate. And I have put him in charge of uh, administering the farewell lecture that I'm going to have on Monday. So he's going to be in charge of the um, running that lecture, basically. I'm going to be talking the content, but he's doing the running of the lecture. Uh, Alex Gostomelsky, originally from Ukraine, by the way, but he came here about 20 years ago. It is my understanding. So that's the profile. We studied the profiles over here. We developed the model. Uh, very comprehensive. It took us a year to do this work, by the way. We would usually no normally go there every couple of weeks for a weekend, usually. Needless to say, we also had a lot of fun while doing the work. We also studied the uh, groundwater because there was an issue of groundwater. And it, the, the groundwater continues to be an issue because they are depleting the groundwater. I can't tell you how the depletion has been going on for the last eight years since I wasn't there. But when I was there, they were depleting the groundwater because they uh, have um, about, at the time there were 60 places where you, they, they produce wine. And according to what I've heard, I'm not a wine expert, but they, have, they produce good wine, actually expensive wine. There's stories about that, but I can't tell you at this point, if we got into the stories, we'll never get out of there on the wine and the quality of the wine in Guadalupe Valley. This is the bridge that I wanted to show you in of which we are, we are going to calculate the two, uh, two piers right on the, on the river. We used the formula of Melville and we calculated the scar on the piers was going to be 8.7, which is a number that you, by the way, must get to. And uh, erosion, that's another picture of the bridge. Way, the bridge. And finally, um, and uh, we have in here uh, this group, a uh, research group formed by myself with uh, Walter Suniga, who was a professor over at the university. Uh, uh, he worked for the municipality, also at the university. Then we also have uh, Alberto Castro, who is a very good friend of mine. Uh, in, he's a top hydrologist in Tijuana. And then the other two students, Alexander Rostomelsky and Rosa Aguilar. So that's the end of this report. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back here. So I'm going to show you briefly a video that was put together by none other than my professor, Everett Richardson, who was, who was the mastermind behind the first edition of HEC 18. So it merits, since we have been talking so much about HEC 18, and I believe it's in fourth edition, 2012, we read that, we not read, we briefly browsed through it, but the gentleman that was responsible for the first edition, and unfortunately I can't tell you when, but it must have been, I would say 30 years ago, hydraulics at Colorado State University. I'm, I'm Everett Richardson. Everett Richardson. I signed up at Colorado State University 49 years ago. So Everett Richardson, interesting story about myself is that when I signed up in 1973, that was 49 years ago, 49 and a half years ago, because 2023 is coming in eight, seven months. Uh, Richardson, Professor Richardson was my first boss. And I carried out some assignments for him. You can see this picture on the right is a year before when he produced this video, a year before he died. I believe he died in the year 2012 or 13. And this other picture on the left, obviously a picture when he was young. I am from Scottsbluff, Nebraska. I graduated in June 49. My favorite professors as the head of the department, uh, Robert Smith, Max Parshall, Max Parshall was the developer of the partial flume. So a lot of the people who worked at Colorado State were very uh, leading hydraulicians in the United States and in the world. Uh, the partial flume is used. It's a, it's, a, it's a critical flow flume in order to measure flows. As they, we, what, the, what the partial flume does is it, it forces a critical flow and critical flow is, uh, has a unique rating and so that you can measure the, the flow in only one place. And that allows you to just run the, the water through the flume and measure the amount of water by measuring just one stage. That was a development that was done, I would say in the 40s by uh, uh, Max Parchel, who is here, right here, right, a gentleman in the left. And, uh, and Maury Albertson came there, I think it wasn't, I think he came in 47. 
and I went to work for him at the hydraulics lab. Uh, he really in, invigorated the hydraulic program. It was all based on what he did. Nothing was going on there. And There's Maury Albertson, the one in the middle, one of, my, one of my professors. The other two gentlemen must be students. Until the day who he came. So in 68, uh, as I said, I became a professor of civil engineering and administrative engineer at the Engineering Research Center, where I worked directly under Daryl. And uh, he was an associate dean of research for the College of Engineering. This gentleman here is Daryl Simons, uh, my boss for a few years out there when I was there, right after I graduated. Actually, it was Daryl Simons that gave me the job I held for four years right after graduation. Engineering. Daryl and I had produced a film called Flowing Alluvial Channels. It done very by the way, we already read the paper by Daryl and uh, Simons and Richardson. That was the one of the first papers that we read in this class. Good film. And I think it's one of the best ever done. Dr. Baldwin was deed, fabulous person. Terrific work. It really helped back us. Uh, he just uh, he was more of the education man. Started the surge program and uh, just did so many things. In '68, things started breaking and some other things. That's when we started the on pond water management program in Pakistan. A CSU agronomy graduate, Dr. Omar Kelly was head of agriculture for the Agency for International Development. This Omar Kelly was a good friend, and, and he put us all together. And Maury was and Daryl were involved in, in the establishment of uh, what we call the Fuchs Wash, and we finally changed it to Consortium for International Development. And that was a consortium of Utah State, Colorado State, University of Arizona, and the University of California at Riverside. We did to Pakistan. I did a trip for, uh, on my own to Pakistan and I did one with Maury to determine if there was any, they asked us to determine if there was any way by soil conservation methods that we could decrease the amount of sediment going into Tarbella Reservoir. Obviously, if you do soil conservation, there's going to be a reduction in the sediment going into the reservoir. No question about it. And I guess from what uh, Rich is saying here, Professor Richardson, they worked at it for several years at the time. You see a few of the spring froze. In the building of Tarbella Dam, uh, Dr. Karaki had a big, spent a lot of model studies on it and spent a lot of time in the design of Tarbella Dam. Uh, Jim Ball also did some studies. There was cavitation problems on it. So let me just move on to the next chapter, which is which corresponds to what we're going to be doing today. This is the 15th week today. So uh, I have several items here that I wanted to uh, share with you. There's seven aside items. So let's see how far we get here. The first one is the Federal Interagency Sedimentation Project. This is a website. I believe it's dated 2012, but it is a federal website. It's usually maintained by the, the people in, in charge. So this is, let me see if we are lucky here. Yes, we are. It's a USGS website, right? USGS must have taken the lead on, on, on showing the website, but this is the uh, agency or inner agency responsible for the development of the uh, measurements sediment measurements in the United States. Basically, I'm sure that in Europe, they may have other practices similar to ours, but there's other practices. But this is the practice of the United States. And it has been endorsed, as you see, by two, four, six, seven water agencies. I can see, I was checking this out this morning, and I can see that the SCS is nowhere to be found. At the time, the Soil Conservation Service so I don't know that. I don't know the politics of that. But the fact of the matter is that USDA ARS, which is the research branch of SES, maybe that's why, how they consider that. They gave it to the research branch, which is good. But the SES is a field agency, and perhaps they decided they weren't going to participate or something. I don't know the ins and outs of that. I know the SES is missing from here. Soil Conservation Service, which later became Natural Resources Conservation Service in 1996. 
after the government, the federal government decided that they didn't have anybody taking care, they, they had no agency taking care of the natural resources. So they basically gave it to the SES and they changed its name. Army Corps of Engineers, they are in charge of uh, flood and navigation throughout the United States, throughout the United States. Uh, Bureau of Land Management, they are in charge of public lands in the Western United States, only in the Western United States. Why is that? Because there are no public lands in the Eastern United States. That's not the way the country developed. The country was already all settled and owned um, by the mid 1850s, 1890s. And that's when the development of the West or the, I guess you could say the settlement of the West came about, the Western United States. And that settlement, as you guys know very well, uh, had to be done in a certain way. And, uh, and the US government took uh, charge of the entire country, the Western part of the country. And then they started allocating it, selling it or whatever, adjudicating it to various people, uh, the settlement, right? But there's a whole swath of, I mean, a whole lot of quantities of area in the Western United States, namely the 10 Western United States that were left as property of the federal government. And then the federal government gave the Bureau of Land Management um, uh, jurisdiction so the Bureau of Land Management, I believe, operates only on the 10 Western United States. The Bureau of Reclamation, same thing. Actually, the Bureau of Reclamation operates only 11 Western United States. I cannot tell you for sure at this point how many states uh, are covered under, under the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Land Management, because I don't know. I have not researched that. But I know the Bureau of Reclamation. I learned about the Bureau of Reclamation very early in, the, in my career when I was... Uh, senior or junior in um, engineering school. That was in 1963. No, I'm sorry, 65. Because we, um, we got a hold, we had to, of the book by Chow, that had been, uh, Venti Chow, that had been published in 1959. And by 65, it was just everywhere. It was a good book. It is still a good book. Even though Professor Ponce has written a book which is supposed to supersede it or change it or complement it, but it doesn't matter. That's another story. But the point is that I've heard about the Bureau of Reclamation since 1965, uh, great agency. It was created in the year 1903 by none other than the Teddy Roosevelt, who uh, decided that uh, he and the government of the United States was going to, they were going to underpin the development of the Western United States. How did that happen? And why did they take that decision? Interesting. Um, um, Oh, I forget the name, uh, Cadillac Desert. The author of Cadillac Desert tells the story. He says, he says in that book, which I have read two or three times, that um, settlement of the United States started right after the um, invention and the operation of, the, of rail. Rail went on from Chicago, I suppose, to San Francisco. And then right after that, everybody climbed on the train and they came over here and then there was settlement of the United States. We're talking here 1860s, 1870s, 1890s. And when they moved to California, where California was fun, it was nice, it was a lot of sun, but it also had a lot of droughts. <laughs> right now we're undergoing a drought. The entire Western United States is undergoing a drought. People say that it is related to global climate change. I don't know. You know there's a lot of stuff, talk, a lot of talk about that. But the point is that we had a lot of sun in California. We also had a lot of droughts. In, the people, the early settlers, were getting a little bit uptight about the, about the droughts because they came from the Midwest and in the Eastern United States. In the Midwest, they have a drought every 20 years and it's very mild. In the Eastern United States, hardly any droughts at all because it's so wet, right? So for people from that part of the country to come over here and find the droughts or have to contend with the droughts, that was hard. So then they complained to the government. And basically, according to uh, the book uh, Cadillac Desert, which I already mentioned to you several times, they uh, confronted the US government and they said toward the end of the, of the 19th century that uh, it was gonna fail. The, the, the experiment in California was gonna fail. And that's when Teddy Roosevelt decided to put things into action and he created, he and the government created the US Bureau of Reclamation for the intent of reclaiming Western lands for agriculture and basically fighting floods, fighting, fighting droughts and, 
becoming the premier hydraulic agency, hydraulic engineering agency of the United States. So we had the Bureau of Reclamation for about 120 years now, uh, 1903. So it's 119 years exactly. Uh, environmental Protection Agency that came about after the environmental movement got started in the year 1970. Forest Service has been there. I don't know exactly when they started, but you can imagine there was forests and that they needed to be protected, defended, and so forth. And the Geological Survey, the date of the Geological Survey, I believe is 1887, when the federal government decided at the time very early. It's probably the earliest, uh, the oldest agency that we have here in the United States. No, I take that back. The Army Corps of Engineers is much older than the Ge Geological Survey. The Army Corps of Engineers started with, uh, with the war. Somebody, uh, not somebody, it's been known that, for instance, George Washington was an engineer. George Washington, you know. So at any rate, those are the seven agencies. So I refer you to this page in case you wanted to get more information later on. This is a government site, so it's fine. I mean, it's not gonna go away. Uh, so that's, that's one. Um, a couple of papers or re uh, reports by the US Geological Survey, field methods for measurement of fluvial sediments, in laboratory theory and methods for sediment analysis. Uh, th these are very comprehensive, extensive reports. And I, I'm just gonna do a show here. I'm gonna show you what they, uh, wh who, what they are. For instance, this one is field measurement, field, field methods for measurement of fluvial sediment. This is by Edwards and Glyson, table of contents. There's a table of contents in here. You can see in there, they're talking about samplers and so forth. And now we're going to get to that in more detail, but in some other way later today. Uh, in the PDF files, the PDF files are over here. Section one, section two, section three. They divided the, they divided the, they decided to divide the paper or rather the reporting in four sections, which is good. It's good. You don't have to load the whole thing. You know, at the beginning and even now, uh, the PDF is, is kind of slow. If you have a 200 page report, it will, it will take you five, five minutes to load, depending on the, 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 on your computer. So they decided to do this, which I think it's a good, a good decision. This other one is laboratory theory and methods for sediment analysis. And um, table of contents, again, table of contents over here, the procedures and so forth, procedure for determining suspended sediment concentration, very detailed work that was done early by, um, this was done by Harold B. Guy, which is a very well-known recognized person in the field. Um, so everything that is the standardized knowledge or standard knowledge from the US government is contained in these reports, okay? And over here, part one, for instance, this is part one, laboratory methods and theory and methods for sediment analysis. Over here, you can see, and here you can see in uh, the various sections. I don't quite like this, the size of the letter, but I can't do anything about it. I believe what we could do in here. Yes, that is right. You do, the browser allows you to increase the size. That's cool, isn't it? Browsers are good in general. So in here, we have another report in here that I'm showing you uh, on the content of what we are learning this today, as a matter of fact everything that had to do with measurement, both field measurements as well as laboratory analysis, units of measurement and definitions. Okay, I uh, decided to give you a homework. The last homework I believe in this class has to do with a calculation of the constant that goes in front of the uh, uh, conversion factor. And uh, it's supposed to, uh, I already did it, or it can be done readily, I guess, in US customary systems, but I ask you to do it in the metric system or SI system. Okay. The visual accumulation tool for size analysis of sands. This is an alternative to the sieving. You guys know that sieving is very kind of cumbersome. It's a procedure, it's a standard and so forth. And I know many of you, if not all, must have done some sieving in your life because you took ge geotechnical engineering. And I believe in that class, there's a laboratory, right? And you have to 
go to the laboratory and one of the one of the um, uh, labs, you know, they have a weekly lab or every couple of weeks, and one of them is deceiving the to do the grain size analysis. And that that was good, but people in the sedimentation field realized early that they didn't need that much accuracy. You know how sediment is, it's fuzzy. Sedimentation engineering is really fuzzy. 50% error is no big deal, actually. We know that for a fact, okay? So they decided at the time in 1956 to develop an alternative. And the alternative was called at the time, the visual accumulation tool for size analysis of sands. And this is the original paper by none other than Kobe, Bruce Kobe and his associate Christensen that uh, wrote this paper. They were part of the Federal Interagency Sedimentation Project at Vicksburg, 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 Mississippi. Why Vicksburg, Mississippi? I don't mean anything bad about that, but the point is that at Vicksburg, the Army Corps of Engineer has one of the three so-called wet labs. The Army Corps of Engineers have been around for 200 years, you know that, they deal with water. Why do they deal with water? Because in the War of 1812, you guys know the War of 1812, you take it history. The uh, government, the federal government decided to, decided that um, they were gonna give the Army Corps of Engineers the responsibility for the waterways. So they said, well, you guys are gonna do the navigation. And at the time, the Army Corps, the people with the Army Corps got, I guess they got smart and they decided, well, you guys know that we can't do the navigation with it without doing the flood control. So then it was at that time that the government, the federal government decided to give them both navigation and flood control. So these gentlemen, uh, gentlemen, persons actually, are in charge, there's a large agency, Army Corps of Engineers, very large. They're in charge of navigation and flood control in navigable rivers, but flood control in all the other rivers. They, they have jurisdiction throughout the United States. Uh, those of you that, are, that plan to work in hydraulics and hydrologic engineering, eventually are gonna have to deal with one way or the other with the, with the Army, with the Army Corps. Um, so that's basically the story. Now, this paper has, has the theory of the visual accumulation too over here. And it's a, it's a, I believe this is a, it looks like it's an ASE paper. And in fact, it is an ASE paper, right? It's there, Journal of the Hydraulics Division. Uh, this is dated um, November 1, 1956. So this is the paper that presents for the profession, the visual accumulation tool by Kobe and Christensen. The method, the procedure and so forth, the calibration, the calibration of the, of the equipment. And finally, a, a picture. That's good. That's all I wanted to show you. So you see how it looks. Uh, what does this, this do? Well, this, this procedure, this equipment, drops a sample of sand over here at the end, at the top, I guess. And then what's gonna happen is that that sample is going to settle, but it's gonna settle, settle differentially. The heavier particles are gonna settle faster. We know that because of the fall velocity, right? So by the time you get to the end, it records in here and it gives you, it gives you a distribution of the grain sizes. Easy, isn't it? You don't have to do any measurement or anything like that. So this has taken over uh, grain size analysis in sedimentation engineering. Uh, don't, don't do uh, grain size anymore. In the year 2012 and 13, we did the grain size analysis. I already shown you the work that we did for the, in Mexico. We actually took the samples over here. We did them over here at San Diego State. We did them by grain size analysis. So the question is why? Why didn't you use a visual accumulation too? And the answer is we didn't have one because we relied on the geotech lab. And the geotech lab does not have a visual accumulation tool. What they wanna do is do an exact determination of the grain size analysis, or the distribution of the grain sizes, right? So that's geotech engineering, which as you know, is different than sedimentation engineering. Uh, several years ago, when, I had, when we had the lab recently, the, the year, I believe 2017, in the year 2017, no, no, it was not 18, it was 18, because the new building, opened in January of 2018. That's right, it's been, it's, it's gonna be five years already. 
the, my transitional retirement, <laughs> that, that was the last five years too. So it was in the year 2018, I was still on the faculty. No, I wasn't. Uh, let me see that. No, I wasn't the faculty because I retired uh, transitionally, a uh, FERPing, they call it FERPing in July of, or August of 2018. But we acquired the lab in January of 2018. So it was at that time that I wanted to complement the lab with one of these pieces of equipment. So I looked for it and I found that there's an outfit out there in the United States, somewhere in the Midwest, that they sell this equipment. So they wanted $6,000 for it. And I applied for it, but to be honest with you, I don't remember what happened. We never got it. We never got the money to buy this thing. I uh, talked to Professor Kinoshida at the time since she was taking over. And I said, well, maybe you could do this because I'm quitting, I'm leaving. And, and in the middle of the year, I actually retired. So not my responsibility anymore to handle the lab, right? Or to acquire things from that, the lab and so forth. So I don't know exactly what's, what has gone on, but my guess is that probably, I talked to Professor Kinoshida about it and she said it was gonna be done, but I'm not sure. Some of you may know more than I at this time. But it is a nice piece of equipment and one that should be part of hydraulic engineering with sedimentation. When there's sedimentation, there's an absolute must that we must have a visual accumulation tool. At least you saw it already. You saw, saw, saw this picture, which is not very clear, but it is a picture nevertheless. Don't forget, this is 1956. Okay, so that is the visual accumulation tool. Uh, I have a story in here, which I'm going to share with you field data of questionable quality. I think it's relevant that we talked about quality of field data. So we're gonna, we, in typical fashion, we have a vector and a raster. So I'm gonna show the raster. There are three types of errors in mathematical modeling. One, errors due to inadequate physical and or numerical formulation. Yes. The first error is the method, the digital model does not represent the physics. That's the first error and the most common error, by the way. The easily widely recognized error, there's an error in the scheme. The numerical diffusion is there, is not allowing the physical diffusion to work the way it should be and so forth. So that's one. Two, errors due to inaccuracies in parameter estimation. For instance, the Manning's end was wrongly described. Instead of being 0.025, it was, it was determined that it was 0.03 or estimated to be 0.03. That was an, that's an error. That is an, a hard error to pin down. The way to pin it down is to do a measurement, to do a measurement. But I can tell you that 99 applications out of 100 don't measure anything because it's expensive to measure, right? If you wanted to verify a man in the only way you could do it is to do it doing an actual measurement in the field and it can be verified. The problem is that Manning's end does have a tendency to vary with the flow. Oh, sure, we know that. So then you'd have to get many measurements with at different stages and that's really gets complicated. It really quickly gets out of hand in terms of the cost. So I should admit to you at this time that most chances or most cases of est Manning's end estimations are estimated. And in order to do that, you as an engineer are counting on three things. First of all, you have your experience. You're not a rookie. You're, you didn't get here yesterday. You've been around for two, three years and you've been discussing this with a lot of people and have developed some feeling of what it should be. That's one thing. The other thing is that there's two references. The child book is good, but it's black and white. And then there's the Barnes reference, which is very good. Barnes was a gentleman working in USGS 1967, and he was working precisely on Manning's end estimation, and he decided to do a hundred. He decided he actually had a collection of pictures over the years, and he put together this book, which is a very good book, which is called uh, Roughness in, in, in Channels uh, by Barnes. Um, unfortunately, the book, was published, I believe, by USGS, and it may have gotten out of print. It's hard to find. So I decided in the year 2001, with the help of our people from India, our collaborators from India, we were actually went to the field. We had a project over on the other side of the border back in Mexicali at the time. And we were not very close to Mexicali. It was not quite in Mexicali. 
but it was around there somewhere within 20 miles. And we had to do quite a number of determinations of Mannings in the field. And um, I'm not sure exactly how it went, it's been 21 years ago, but I think what happened was that we either took the, the book, the Barnes book, or decided to scan the entire Barnes book into the web so that we could take our computer, our laptop out there and, and see it. And that we decided to do that. Not, not only was that good for us, but it was also for the benefit of the rest of the people in the, in the world that, that have used this web page, which is part of my book is detailed and listed in chapter five of my open channel book. We, we basically scanned and described the entire Barnes book in one website of my web page or, or website. And I guess I should say in one web page of my website. Okay. So that's and number two. three, errors due to questionable quality of field data. Yeah, the field data could be mistaken. And therefore you have a good model. You did some very good estimations but the field data is not backing you up. So we have to be careful about the quality of the field data. And this story is about that precisely. The first two types are widely recognized while the third type is often overlooked. Data of questionable quality may be due to inappropriate procedures, recording errors, equipment defects. I had two major jobs in the Pantanal of Mato Grosso, 1979 and then 1995. The 1979 was when um, OAS, which stands for the Organization of American States, hired me to do the modeling, uh, the upstream modeling in the Pantanal. They already had a, uh, a central and downstream modeling, which had, they had been operating for oh, more than five or 10 years they spent a lot of money on it. And uh, it was the SAR model, the use of the SAR model. Uh, I've talked about the SAR model, I believe in hydrology, but not in this class. So they, hi they hired me to do that. And I spent two months over there doing that work. It was very uh, enlightening, very, uh, I learned a lot. I had a lot of fun also visiting the entire, the entire basin because I don't go to the field just to look at one spot. We have to look at the whole thing. So we flew the side and so forth, that was fun. And then later on in the year 1995, I uh, made a wrote a proposal and it was hired by um, a um, NGO, I believe in Chicago to do a study, a hydrologic and environmental impact study of the, of the, of the waterway on the Pantanal. So two interventions that I've had over the years. I know those of you that have taken environmental hydrology with me last year, have heard me talk about and refer to the 150 page report that I wrote at the time. It took me one year to write that report. The 1995 report on the hydrologic and environmental impact of the, uh, of the uh, waterway, the Paraná Paraguay waterway. And or non-stationarity of the data. Thus, mathematical models may not necessarily seek to match the field data in every case. In 1995, I completed a study entitled Hydrologic and Environmental Impact of the Paraná Paraguay Waterway on the Pantanal of Mato Grosso, Brazil. I can't say for sure, but this must be the only report with that title. You guys have heard tons of reports on environmental impact, but you probably never heard of a report that is titled Hydrologic and Environmental Impact. Why? Because I felt at the time that the problem was hydrologic more than environmental. So why should I call it environmental when it is in fact 50% hydrologic? So I basically developed this phrase, hydrologic and environmental impact, because we had experience at the time and we had realized that many, if not most of the environment, Im environmental impact reports did a very poor job of describing the hydrology because the, the, the work of environmental impact, right or wrong, for good or for bad, has been taken over by other professions where, which are not necessarily hydrology. There are ecologists, there's geologists, there's all kinds of other people, other professions, good professions, 
But you have to have an, an, an interdisciplinary team to do this kind of stuff. And I can tell you tons of stories about this, but I'm not gonna do it because it will take a lot of time. Uh, suffice it to say that the boss, the chief of the project, of the big project, because I did the small project, but there was a company based in uh, Florida, Florida in Canada, that was doing the big project at the expenditure of about a hundred times the amount of money that I was spending because they, I was, I was hiring myself and I think it was just myself, but they were doing it with a hundred people. So that requires a lot of money. Okay. The chief of that project was a gentleman from Calgary and he was a uh, water quality expert. Actually not, I take that back. My memory is fuzzy at this point. He was an air quality expert. So air quality expert to do a wetland study, forget it. It doesn't work and it did not work. They failed. We, we this, this is a situation of David versus Goliath. You guys know who David is. They were Goliath. And we basically hit him and basically killed him at the time. Killed him mean, meaning that our report got more circulation and more attention than their report. And the report was, our report was 150 pages and theirs was 5,000. That was a mistake, by the way. 5,000 page report, nobody can read. Anyway, let's keep going in here. Earlier, I had traveled to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and met with Newton Carvalho, a colleague who had spent several years doing field major. Newton Carvalho was a very good friend of mine. Unfortunately, two years ago, he went to heaven, passed away. Great guy. You can't find a better guy than Newton Carvalho. Field hydrologist. He spent his life doing sediment measurements. Talk about sediment measurements. He did 30 years of sediment measurements in hydrology also. Uh, it is proper that I should mention Newton Carvalho here at this point, while I am describing the so-called fecho dos morros. Fecho dos morros is a Portuguese phrase that means closing of the hills. This is the place where tectonism in this particular valley raised the surface, the level of the surface, the ground surface for about 40 meters something that has been demonstrated. And how do we know that? Because the slope upstream was raised 40 meters. Remember, I already shown you, recently shown you the profile of the, of the Mexican case. And this is in exactly the same case. We drew the exact profile in here and realized that there had been uplift, tremendous uplift for 40 meters, which basically created the Pantanal. Because before those 40 meters were there, there was no Pantanal. The water flew, I mean, not, not flew, uh, flowed, flow, excuse me, flowed. The water flowed and there was no Pantanal. The uh, run of coefficient before the Pantanal was created was about 25%, meaning 25% of the rainfall shows up as runoff. After the, the, the action of this particular site, which is called Fecho dos Morros very properly, and there is the closing of the hills, the runoff coefficient came down to 8%, so about a third of what was normally there. Now, this, is all, this all has been documented in my report, which I made available last year in our course, Environmental Hydrology. Very important location. Now, this place, it's hard to reproduce, I believe, around the world. I do not know, not to say I have pra practice all over the world. No, I practice here and there but not all over the world. Nobody really has a chance to practice all over the world. I don't know if this happens any, in, other, in any other part of the world, but we are very familiar with it. We visited, flew this, we got on a boat a couple of times and we transversed the river in some areas. So we really are- From the upper familiar. Paraguay River. Together we visited the appropriate agency in search of the field data to use in the study. There was plenty of gauge data, which we collected dutifully. In addition, we found a limited amount of hitherto unpublished sediment data, consisting of monthly sediment concentration at two gauging stations, Cáceres and Porto Esperanza. There was data, sediment data. And we were out there in Rio de Janeiro one day with uh, Newton, my friend Newton. And he said, well, there's this data, sediment, which has been unpublished. And I said, oh, really? So we looked at it. And uh, in my wisdom at the time, I said, with this, this has been not unpublished, it has been unpublished and it looks good data. It was put together by the right people, uh, Newton among them, by the way, my friend. 
So I picked up the data and decided to publish in this report. So we published the data. This is in the Puerto Esperanza, one of the locations, and the other one, I don't remember, but it's mentioned. It. For a five-year period, 1977. Monthly measurements of sediment in the five-year period. Printer, 1982. Concentration Newton and this himself had participated in the sediment measurements. I thought it important to publish the sediment. It was Porto Esperanza, which is kind of in the middle of the river, and Cáceres, which is upstream. And like I said, these measure the sediment discharge on the left side and the water and uh, the sediment concentration on the right side. Right. And data, not only to complement the hydrologic impact study, but also for purely historical reasons. The study report was published in August 1995. Several months later, I got a call from Steve Hamilton from Michigan State University. I met Steve in 1995 when I was in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, typically, it would have been uh, Rio de Janeiro. It also would have been uh, Cuiabá. Cuiabá, I think, because he was stationed at Cuiabá. At the time, he was a professor with uh, Michigan State, I believe. He was, I'm not sure if he was doing his PhD or whatever, but he was out there and spent about a couple, couple of years out there measuring and studying the river. Who had spent several years working on the Upper Paraguay River. Needless to say, I knew Steve personally. So six months later, after I published my report, he called me up. I was in San Diego already. He mentioned to me that in his experience, there was something wrong with the published sediment measurements. Some of the concentration values, particularly the November 1977 Puerto Esperanza data point, appear to be too high. Immediately after hanging up the phone, I called Newton for clarification. I asked him, Newton, can you think of anything wrong with the 1977-1982 sediment data for the upper Paraguay? He paused for a moment and said, as a matter of fact, now that you mention it, we had some sample leakage during transport, which may have caused some of the concentration values to be too high. So basically, in, in uh, Hamilton's experience, some of those values were too high because he had been there for three years and never measured anything that high. And he wanted to point me out that there was something wrong with the data. And, and Newton confirmed that, in fact, since he was responsible and he did the data, that it was one occasion or two occasions where this, that what it was not kosher, the whole thing was messed up at that one, one or two measurements in the river. And it was interesting that Hamilton was able to find that and look for it and find it and make me aware that this was actually going on. So we actually published an errata sheet on the report because you know we have a report we have a print copy of the report but we also have a web copy html because that's the way we want to do it we we scan it and then we ocr it you know ocr stands for scanning optical character recognition and then you got to clean it up because the scanner is not perfect so you have somebody or you do it yourself clean it up this was a 150 page report we had to be cleaned up under, under the regular html but we specialize in doing that Large jobs are, are we, we like large jobs because we get into it and we don't stop until we finish. Thus, the moral of the story is, publication of data does not imply correctness in all cases. You, those of you that have seen my, um, the video of my classes would recognize this music. This is uh, Jacques Offenbach, the French musician. Um, can't remember the name of the piece right now. My memory today is really terrible. But uh, I've used that uh, piece of music extensively. Sediment measurements, we got about 15 minutes to do. And we're not going to do a service, but it's fine. We're going to try. Uh, I'm not going to cover, probably not going to cover the web video. That's an old video, but if you wanted to, you can later on. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get to this, which is third, section 13.5 of my book, my 
my hydrology book. Remember I said that, um, that I wrote a hydrology book in the year 1989, okay? Well, actually I wrote it in 85, 86, and 87. And then it took two years to publish. That's the way it is. I spent uh, two and a half years actually writing this book, uh, off and on, because I was teaching also. I was working, I was consulting and this and that, but, but uh, we did it. And, um, and so this, and I decided to add three chapters in there, the groundwater, because it was related to water, Okay, the snow also related to water, and finally the sediment. So I do not believe there is books out there in hydrology that cover sediment because they don't think it's 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 hydrology. Actually, it is, but it's not typical hydrology or classical hydrology. So they don't include it. I decided to include it because I felt that there was one of my fortes, sediment stuff, right? Because I studied sediment. I went to school and studied sediment. So I did that. I did that. I wrote this report, or rather chapter, which we have covered extensively. I'm in, I'm in the last section of that chapter now. We covered one, two, three, four. Now we're at five. Little that I know that I believe 20 years later, I was in, I believe in Irvine at a meeting, at a SEE meeting. And uh, I was standing in there in the hall, I guess. And uh, I met my professor, E.B. Richardson. The gentleman that I tried to show the video recently, I mean, a, a while ago, and he, and he met me and he wanted to get a hold of me for some reason. Well, I, I know Rich very well. So there's no surprise that he was greeting me at the time. But he did say something like this, which I really, it really pleased me. He said, Hans, I want to congratulate you because that chapter, that section on uh, sediment that you wrote for your hydrology book is excellent. He said, particularly the sediment. The sediment, because he was a sediment gentleman, so, so he complimented me. Complimented me on the on the writing of that last uh, chapter in my hydrology book, which dealt with his subject, and he said it was very summarized, concisely summarized, and so forth. So that's what we're seeing here, or we're reading here tonight. We're talking about sediment sampling equipment. Uh, we have a here a picture of a cable and reel setup, Campo Creek at Campo Gauging Stations, San Diego County, California. To be honest with you, I, I did a lot of work in Campo from the year 2000 to the year 2005 or six. I worked for, um, I had a project with um, with the uh, agency, CERP, it was called CERP, Southwest Center for Environmental Research and Policy. They were funded by the federal government to, to fund, they were funded in general, but they didn't, they, 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 distributed the funds among researchers like myself at San Diego State and universities along the Mexico border, US-Mexico border. So we were giving relatively small amounts of money, right? They were giving like 50 or 100 grants per year and each grant was about 40, $50,000. They distributed about 2 million bucks, which were given to them by the federal government under this program, which is called CERP. So I was funded by them for seven years from 1999 to the year 2006, I believe. So I spent a lot of time in Campo, Campo Creek. This is Campo Creek. I've actually transversed Campo Creek from the beginning to the end. Well, I'm not gonna say from the beginning. I didn't climb up the hills to get to the origination of the rivers, but I was on, in Campo. I'm very familiar with Campo Creek itself. Campo Creek is an interesting river because it originates in Campo, in the outskirts of Campo. I don't know if you guys have been to Campo, but Campo is out there. Uh, Eastern San Diego County. And then this river moves into Mexico because hydrology is not stopped by political boundaries. It moved in, moves into Mexico and it eventually becomes the, the uh, first it joins with Tecate. It becomes Tecate Creek and then it becomes something else. I don't remember exactly the, the, the hydrography, but it eventually be, it moves into Mexico. It becomes the Alamar. And then the Alamar becomes a Tijuana, and then the Tijuana goes back into the United States. It goes into, it was into Mexico for a while and then goes back to the United States. It exits into the Pacific Ocean at Imperial Beach. Now that you should know or must know. At Imperial Beach is the outlet or the mouth of the Tijuana River, which comes from Mexico, which comes from Campo, which is in the US. So that's the, the, the river that we're now looking at. 
Now, there are various samplers, and I'm not going to discuss in detail the samplers, only to show you the pictures, and so you get an idea of what this is all about. There's been two or three occasions throughout my career where, where we have had to do measurements or handled measurements. So I'm familiar with not all of these, because in order to be familiar with all of these, you must have sampled or rather worked on small rivers, medium-sized rivers, large rivers, and I have not done that. But um, this is a D USD H48 sampler, which is, I believe, the one that we used, that we have used this. And as you can see, you can purchase this. There are several vendors out there that are selling this, these types of equipment. So this is the, UH, the US depth hand. I, I believe the H stands for hand, hand, hand held, hand held. 48 depth integrating suspended sediment sampler. And the people of the federal interagency right there, federal Inter interagency sedimentation project that developed this tool or this piece of equipment maybe 40, 50 years ago, uh, decided that they were gonna do it this way. And they were gonna let the, the water into the bottle at a constant rate. And they were gonna transverse the, the depth of the river because there's a profile in there, as you know, the sediment profile. And they must've done a lot of work in a lot of, uh, reports in order to produce the correct measurement. And that's what they did. We believe that is the correct measurement. It has to, in order to, for it to be correct, according to the Einstein theory and so forth, it has to be done the way they say it should be done. And this is the basic tool, the cheapest actually, the smallest tool that you could use. They also have this one, this one at DH-59, it's a little heavier. This is 20, 22 pounds. This other one is three pounds. So this one can be handled readily. 22 pounds of much larger river. And this one is uh, 25 pounds, this one over here. Then the bed load samplers, because you know that the suspended load, bed load, and then bed material, there's three of them. And they, all, of them, all of them have different samplers. This is the bed load sampler, which I believe we also have used because in, in the Guadalupe River, we, we had to do this because we did uh, sediment routing and so forth. We did all kinds of studies out there. And I've already shown you the report. Unfortunately, it is in Spanish. We had, were planning to do that translation into English, by the way, but we never did it. Maybe I should do that when I retire. It was never done because they didn't require it. They, they, it was in Mexico and they wanted a, the report in Spanish. So we produced a report in Spanish at the time, now the year 2013, I believe. Uh, the USBL84 is a cable suspended bed load sampler used to collect samples from streams that cannot be weighted. This one over here. This one is uh, 32 pounds. 32 pounds is heavy. So this is done with equipment. Bed material samplers. We also use this bed material sampler, by the way. Uh, vertical pipe or core sampler. We use this core sampler over in, um, in uh, Mexico, in Guadalupe Valley. U.S. bed material sampler. Because we did routing and we had to have all the information for the routing. Okay, that's the size of our, that's a seven and a half pound bed material sampler, core sampler. This one is also a bed material sampler. This one uh, designed to scoop up a sample of bed sediment around three inches wide and two inches deep. We, I have not used this one. It is heavy, by the way, 32 pounds. We use this one, which is light. This is seven pounds. The sampler weighs, the VMH53 weighs seven pounds. This other one is a VMH60 weighs 32 pounds. That would have to be handled in a some, some, uh, somewhat different way because it's heavy. And then there's a 54, VM54. This is not, doesn't have an H, so this cannot be handled. This cannot be done by hand. Like I told you, the H uh, relates to hand operated. So VM54, bed material sample, sampler, 100 pounds. It's this one over here. And this is a table that I prepared to show the various types of samplers. So the samplers in common use by US federal agencies. And finally, at the end, uh, this formula, which I urge you to confirm that in fact, uh, the coefficient in there for the proper units or the esteem, est stated units is 0 0.027. And once you do that, then it will be easy for you to do the job of uh, finishing up the uh, assignment number 12. 
basically I asked there to figure out what this number should be in the SI customary system, or rather in the SI system, not the customary, the US customary or SI. So that's the end of this now. So we basically covered this ground. So what I'm gonna do now, if it's okay with all of you guys, I'm gonna go back in here and see if I can pick it up. You tell me if we're work, if it's working. Okay? I'm, I'm Everett Richardson. I am from Scottsboro, Nebraska. I graduated in June 49. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, then it's good. That means we'll recover. My favorite professors as the head of the did terrific work for many things. In 68, things started breaking our development. This Omar Kelly was a good friend and, okay. and he put us all together. And Maury was and Daryl were involved in, in the establishment of uh, what we call Casus Wash. And we finally changed it to Consortium for International Development. And that was a consortium of Utah State. Don't forget here that you're talking to the gentleman that basically was responsible for the first edition of the famous HEC 18. That's why I wanted to show his video. I love this video anyway. I really like Rich. He, he was uh, basically a role model for me very early in, the, in my profession, 1973 to 75. Colorado State, University of Arizona, and University of California at Riverside. We did Pakistan. I did a trip for, on my own to Pakistan and I did one with Maury to determine if there was any, they asked us to determine if there was any way by soil conservation methods that we could decrease the amount of sediment going into Tarbella Reservoir. Now I'm gonna tell you a story, which is a fascinating and interesting story. I have repeatedly said at the, at the risk of generating envy, which it always happens by the way, envy is omnipresent, that um, Richardson was, my, was on my committee, my PhD committee, but he had engagements in Pakistan as he is narrating here in this video. And he happened to be absent the day I defended my PhD uh, thesis that was done in June of the year 1976. He was absent. So he called his associate, Daryl Simons, who, to substitute for him. And Simons was not on my committee, but he came in because uh, they had to have four people on the committee and the, the main person was absent. So Daryl Simons came in there and that benefited me. That that strike of, uh, struck of, how do you say, strike of luck, uh, the luck. The fact that Richardson was replaced by Simons benefited me because Simons came in, saw what I had done, was impressed. And I'm not kidding you, the next day he offered me a job. Had it been Richardson, the guy that was there, he would not have offered me a job because he, he was not in that situation. But Simons had resources, had money, and had the power to offer jobs. So that's the way it happened. So uh, the story would be quite different had it Rich been there. She is, but she he was handed. In the building of the Tarbella Dam, uh, Dr. Crockett had a big, spent a lot of model studies on it and spent a lot of time in the design of Tarbella. Crockett had a big, spent a lot of. Haraki is one of my very esteemed, I don't know how I'm doing this, is one of my very esteemed professors. He basically taught me all the fluid mechanics that I know. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say that jokingly because I know fluid mechanics, but I'm not an expert. I don't consider myself an expert. But Karaki was the guy chosen to teach us, a group of us, about 10 people at that time. He taught all the fluid mechanics. And all the th uh, three fluid mechanics courses we at the time had uh, 10 week uh, quarters, not semesters. So I took three fluid mechanics courses with Karaki. And one day he came in and he said, this is one of my best stories, by the way. We got a couple minutes, one minute. And he says, guys, I decided to do something different today with the exam. He says, it's gonna be a, a take home. Take home? Yeah, he says, and it's gonna be three hours and it's gonna be closed book. And everybody went like, huh? Really? 
So the thing went on. It was a take home three hour closed book. And we don't have the time at this point to dwell on the on how that thing developed, but it was, Model it was fascinating, on. interesting. We did at can you imagine take home three hour closed book? We spent a lot of time in the design at Tarbella Dam. Uh, Jim Ball also did some studies. There was cavitation problems on it. Well, I think CSU and the time under Morgan and Chamberlain and uh, Dean Baldwin it was really risk. They would take risks. Morgan and Ray both said that if you got the right person, he would build a program. We got Herb Real to come, Maury and uh, Daryl and Ray Chamberlain. They got him to come. The universities are not the buildings. They are the people. If you had the right people, you can put together the buildings. Here from Chicago. And so he came in the civil department. We have the high head with the, with the horse tooth reservoir. We have a large discharge. We have a lot of volume. We have big flumes. All the work we've done in Scour, but we put UCSU on the map when it comes to designing the foundation of bridges to be safe from the erosion of water and not. He's talking about our subject, this week's subject. 1970, a man by the name of Frank Johnson, head of hydraulics of the Federal Highway Administration, Washington, D.C. He's talking about the inception of the HEC 18 project, which he was in instrumental in generating for the first time. So this is history. He came to me and asked if I, he, if Daryl and I could put a, a manual together and teach hydraulic engineers, river mechanics, they in the de, for the design of their bridges. He said, we, we just got to get them looking at the river not just at the highway and the structures, but what, what do we do to the river and what does the river do to us? We wrote a manual to sat thick and, and devised a course. And he and I taught that course 40 or 50 times in all, practically all the states in the union. Then from that, we did uh, what we call the HEC 18, came out. The story of HEC 18 from the lion's mouth, isn't that fascinating? Volume one of the publication, Evaluating Scour Bridges. And this is the fourth edition, which was out in May, 2001. The authors are myself and Stan Davis on that. So that's the fourth edition, but the fifth edition came about right after, I believe 2012. It may have been when he had already passed away. So out of that, and this is the first, from the very beginning, the most comprehensive, publication in the United States on evaluating scour bridges. I've taught the course in Korea, taught the course in Portugal, and we've taught the course to engineers from all 50 states. And, uh, and that's one of the things that CSU has prominently mentioned and one of the things I'm proudest of. Okay, we are reached the end of this class. So I, uh, I'm going to work this weekend on the exam, which uh, is posted. When is it going to be? I don't remember at this time. I think it's going to be, let me not say that. It is posted already. When the, it was posted since the beginning of the semester. When the exam is going to be? The exam is going to be two hours as opposed to an hour and 15 minutes for the midterm. There's going to be 12 questions out of which you have to answer. You must answer 10 if you want to get full credit. You don't have to answer two of them. You, so you can pick and choose which ones you want to answer. This will my practice for many years, by the way. Give you a little bit of leeway. And um, I will take 24 to 48 hours after the uh, final day to grade. And then subsequently, once I finish the grading, I will post the grades. And I do wish you good luck, all kinds of good things in your career, which you are just getting started. I suppose, right? You're getting a master's degree. Uh, some of you may actually choose to go to the PhD as I did. I took a master's degree and then three years later after practicing, I decided to go to the to a PhD because I wanted to get into an academic environment. I felt that that was more me than being in the field. I had been in the field for several years, by the way, three years at the time. And I, while I enjoy the field and I still enjoy it, I felt that uh, 
I had the brains to be in an academic environment, to be honest with you. So basically that's how we did it. So thank you very much for your attention throughout the semester and sometimes your patience. Uh, we're not perfect. We're always trying to be perfect, but nobody is perfect. There's only one, there's only one perfect person and you know, you guys know who he or she is. With that, thank you very much. And I will see you uh, at the posted time and day for the final. I'll see you some of you this Monday because we're having the farewell lecture. If you are interested in listening, those of you that are not attending that class, if you're interested in listening to that farewell lecture, it's a different subject, but if, you, if you're interested, let me know and I will make sure that you get an invitation. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.